Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our third forum, is it, Dan? Yeah. Third forum on the NGO Flood Recovery Program. Um, before I kick off, um, and most of the talking will be done by the team, um, before I do that is I would like to acknowledge that we are all meeting on Aboriginal land. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander colleagues, colleagues that may be on the call today and to all the uh, uh, First Nations people that we work with every day in the communities that we serve. Um, what we are doing today is talking about the open competitive grant um, process for the flood recovery program um and uh the the session will be going through the the details in the program guideline um and and go through the application process um we launched this program in response to the flood event last year that started in that september october period in the or august september period I should say um, in central and western New South Wales, and it was a follow on from a similar program that we had for northern New South Wales. Um, and uh, I think Sally um, was one of those people that will work on the northern New South Wales um, uh, uh, program as well, who've come over to work on this one. Um, it's really critical. Uh, we know that NGOs support their local communities, um, individuals and families through the recovery process um, of the, the flood event. And it is a long tail to that recovery process. Um, so this grant program is designed for NGOs to uh, uh, meet increased demand and meet uh, the, the changing circumstances of their local community. So it is quite flexible. Um, we will go through in detail of what the grant funds can be useful but it's also important to know what it can't be useful um so you know very basic stuff around the actual infrastructure recovery type uh, uh work which is already there's already uh, other government programs or local council programs that are doing that um we we won't be able to support activities associated with existing flood uh, type um, of, of uh, programs or grants. So it has to be um, unique to delivering human services to uh, communities. So I'll leave it there and throw it over to Dan and the team to get into the meaty details of the, the program. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, so I'm Dan Jacobs. I'm the manager of the Grants Design and Support Projects team here at DCJ. Um, so we're the team that uh, runs the NGO Flood Recovery Grant Program. Um, Sarah, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so we'll get through some of the boilerplate first. So um, so this is a $9.1 million grant program um, uh, co-funded by both the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments to support communities to recover from the central and western New South Wales floods that commenced in August, September last year. It's open to NGOs, Aboriginal organisations, community organisations and DCJ service providers that provide human services. Um, and that's important, human services. It is about um, people. It doesn't, it's not uh, eligible to organisations that are uh, only provide assistance to uh, animals or to the environment or something like that. It has to be organisations that do human services. Um, and the, those services need to be in the LGA's designated disaster areas under AGRN 1030 and 1034. I don't expect that to mean to anything to you. That just me is the local government areas that were de uh, declared disaster zones in response to the August September floods. Um, you can see a list of those LGAs on the right hand side of this presentation. Um, so these are the ones that are designated disaster areas, but also in the DCJ districts of Western Murrumbidgee, Far West and New England. Um, so if you're providing services in one or more of these areas, you are eligible. If you aren't, you are not. Um, and as Stephen was saying, the, the flood recovery program is based on the successful NGO flood support program, which is the one we rolled out in northern New South Wales last year in response to the floods in northern New South Wales in February. Uh, Sarah, next slide. So what does the actual NGO flood recovery program do? It provides one-off grants to NGOs and Aboriginal organisations to help address the difficulties you're experiencing. And we know those are about, um, in response to the floods, there's an increased demand for core services, more people uh, requiring your ordinary services. 
um, due to the effect of the floods on them. Um, and that includes like the long tail of those effects of the flood. Um, addresses the need for new services. So if your uh, organization set up new services or programs in response to the floods, it covers that as well. Um, so that might be, you know, if you some, we had organizations in Northern New South Wales that, you know, were running a counseling service, but ended up setting up a little food bank in their, ki in their kitchen because they were one of the few places that were not flood affected in those days. So anything like that is covered. And also managing the impact of the floods on staff and volunteers. So we know that when there's an increased demand, it does create you know issues around burnout. Um, and so uh, floods funds are available through this grant program to sort of prop up some of the staffing and volunteer work. What grants are are available? There's four levels of open competitive grants. So you have to nominate one of these four. So you can either up request a ten thousand dollar grant, fifty thousand dollar grant, hundred thousand dollar grant, or a two hundred thousand dollar grant. Um, and the total pool available is six and a half million dollars. Um, to apply, you have to apply using Smarty Grants. Smarty Grants is an online um, grant management program that has online forms where you can, um, when you're completing the form, you can stop, save, and come back to it as often as you like. You can access the form before you officially sign up. But at the end of this session, after we do the Q&A, Ella from my team will actually be doing a step-by-step -step process of how you actually go through the process of applying. So if you're new to applying for, uh, for grants through Smarty Grants, you'll get a bit of an insight there. Um, and you know the link for that is the one that's written on the bottom of the page that also and that link's obviously available on um, our website as well. Uh, Sarah, next slide. The main features of the the flood recovery program that maybe make it slightly different to other grant programs you might have applied for in the past or heard about. The first one is, and this is really important, is that it's not project based. So usually when you're applying for a grant, it tends to be, um, somebody's asked you to create a new idea and then say, hi, I would like uh, to apply for a grant to fund this new program I've just thought of or that we've always been planning to do. This one is not project based. It's funding to meet the increased demand for your services, whether it's your core services or new services. And the benefit of that for you is that you don't have to write out a big, long description of what your new program is. This program is meant to help you with the work you do now um, to provide extra funding for that. Um, another feature is that applying and reporting are a lot easier in this grant program than most other grant programs. The application form is much simpler than most you will have come across before, and the reporting requirements are similarly simple. Um, it allows you flexibility to tailor services to meet the need of your local communities. Um, because you are providing less detail in the application and reporting process, it does mean that you have a little bit more flexibility to slightly move things around. Um, one of the one of the things that does make it easier is that there's no requirement for a detailed budget or or detailed project plan. So um, when you're actually when you're actually in the application form describing what you're going to use the money for, there's a 200 word limit box uh, text box, and so you fill in that text box and say this is what we plan on using the money for. Usually, I would you would assume that that will be to fund these services we are already running. Um, would be the idea. And and then rather than there being a detailed budget table that you need to carefully consider, you know, I know I'm going to be staffing cost, you know, spending seventeen thousand two hundred twenty six dollars on staffing and five hundred six hundred twenty dollars on pencils, any of that stuff. It's not doesn't require that level of detail. The proposed expenditure table where you do put it just requires you to provide uh, high level estimates of what you think you'll spend the money towards. So you might say, you know. You might be uh, volunteer uh, volunteer travel, and then you'd have a you put in a really round number to cover that, or staffing. You provide a really round number to cover that. You won't be required to provide a level, level of detail, which makes it easier to complete the application form. One of the other things that's benefit is it's flexible because you are, as I said before, as because you're providing less detail as you go through. Um, it gives you a bit more flexibility to change things down the line. Like one of the big uh, feedbacks we got in relation to the Northern New South Wales program and to previous programs we've run for other disasters and in relation to COVID was it can be really hard to make your application and know exactly how you're going to spend the money over the year. That's always difficult, but it's particularly difficult with these things where circumstances are going to change. Like because this is based on your ordinary work, you don't 100% know if your work's going to increase or detract in, detract in one area and the other. So. The fact that you can provide less details means you don't have to come back to us 
every two seconds to check to see, you know, oh, actually, I want to slightly adjust things. I want to spend a bit more money on staff and a bit less money on whatever. You're able to do a bit more of that within yourselves and you can just let us know via email as opposed to asking us for a formal variation of your contract or anything like that. So as we were talking about before, the assessment requirements are that you provide you provide a short statement of no more than 200 words describing what you are going to use the money on, and then you do a 200 words each against each of these five assessment criteria. These are the five assessment criteria that appear in the program guidelines. Um, so first one, demonstrate there's increased demand for your services. Second one, that you have capacity if you receive this funding to meet the increased demand for these services. Three, you have the capability to deliver high quality, flexible and sustainable services. So those three high quality, flexible, sustainable are the three things we're looking for information on there. Um, demonstrates an ability to understand and respond to the changing needs of local communities. So it's really about making sure that you are ingrained in your local community and you are across what um, your community wants and needs and you're not sort of provide, you know, directing from above. And the last one is, is able to fully expend the grant by the end of the grant period, September 2024. That's just a tick box. So you don't even actually provide a word, um, a long word session for that. You just tick a box for that. And that's really important because these are one-off grants. So this is a one-off grant thing where you will get the doc. If you are successful, you'll get the full amount of money and you'll need to expend it within 12 months. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Sarah? Thank you. Um, so a couple of the particular features that are particular to this uh, grant program. One of them is reimbursement. As you probably know, if you apply for other grant programs, usually you can't seek money to reimburse costs you've already incurred. Usually it's a case of we want you to only spend, uh, ask for money that you spend in the future. In this grant program, you can devote 25% of the grant you receive for reimbursement of expenses you've incurred since the floods in relation to the floods. So um, so if you apply for a $100,000 grant, then you can spend a quarter of it or $25,000 directly towards reimbursement. And so you don't need to provide us with a whole lot of detail on that. You tick a box in the application form saying, I would like to uh, devote 25% of my grant towards reimbursement. In the proposed expenditure table, you probably put as one of your entries reimbursement and then what you're planning to reimburse with it, reimbursement staffing, reimbursement, whatever, and put it in there. And that's the only details we'll be asking for in relation to that. Uh, subcontracting. So we have something subcontracting. A lot of you might know this uh, more commonly as auspicing. Um, so we do allow uh, subcontracting or auspicing in relation to this program. So if your organisation is formally partnering with another organisation or individual providing assistance in the floods, you can subcontract, put in the talk scare quotes, allow you to devote part of your funding, including reimbursement to that organisation or individual. So the, what that means is that if your, uh, your NGO has um, been, um, uh, sorry, my messages are bouncing off as much, <laughs> so my apologies. Um, uh, if your um, if your organisation is working with another organisation in partnership, um, and so you're they're assisting you with the work that you do, as long as you enter into some sort of formal agreement with them, you can use part of this funding to direct the money towards them, but we will need to know the details of who that organisation is. And you do need to have some sort of a formal arrangement in place, whether it's something that pre-exists this grant program or as part of this application, you will need to get that in place. That's been used a lot. Um, uh, for those of you who are, have used auspicing in the past, so a couple, a few of our organisations in the last one used auspicing arrangements, which is where an organisation which wouldn't otherwise be able to um, accept money um, from us because they don't have an ABN or they wouldn't be eligible for the grant in one way or another, can instead choose to work with a local organisation who are eligible. And if those two organisations agree and the lead organisation applies on their behalf, then they will get the they and then they're successful. They will get the funding. It's always worth noting, however, that whoever makes the application, whoever is formally the applicant, is the person that somebody we will enter into a grant funding agreement with, and that means that they will be the one that we come to for reporting, etc. You'll be responsible to us for that. So be careful if you are subcontracting to other organisations that you do feel comfortable that you're uh, you can be responsible for their spending as well. Um, and lastly, no more than one application per organisation will be approved. So this is a fairly straightforward thing. You can only apply once per organisation for a grant, even if your organisation operates in several locations. 
So if your organisation has offices in five or six of the different LGAs that are eligible, that's great. We do definitely encourage you to make an application on behalf of all or some of those services, but we will only uh, review one application, uh, we will only accept one application per organisation. If you do provide more than one application, we will review both, but it'll be up to us which one we choose to uh, fund. So I would encourage you to combine your ideas into one application form and do that one application. Um, so uh, I think that covers that. Uh, Sarah, could you move to the next one? As Stephen was saying, there's some important things about fu what funding can't be used for. And this is more limited, for those of you who might have had some experience in the Northern New South Wales one, this is actually a little bit more limited than that due to the Commonwealth requirements. Um, so you can't use fundings for expenses that are already covered by other government grants or insurance payments, for example, replacements of items lost or damaged in the August, September 22 floods. So that's pretty straightforward. You can't ask for money that you've already asked for money from somebody else for. And that goes for whether it's a grant program or insurance. And that's pretty much common across all um, state government grant programs. Um, you can't use funding towards temporary accommodation accommodation arrangements for your organisation. So if you are affected by the floods or anything else and that's meant you move to a uh, temporary accommodation, this funding can't be used to fund that. Um, that's because there are other grants available that do cover that. Um, you can't use funding for infrastructure, equipment or assets in, or purchase of vehicles. Um, so unfortunately, this is one which uh, no funding can be devoted towards equipment or assets. It's not meant for buying things or repairing things. Um, you can't use this funding for commercial ac activities. That's pretty straightforward. Um, you can't use it to pay off debts or budget deficits that you had before the floods hit. I think that's pretty straightforward as well. You can't use the funds for costs not related to service delivery. Um, so often we'll get applications which will say, and also we'd like to go to this conference or something like that, that's not going to be eligible. The fund, the way you use the funding does have to be directly re related to providing human services to people affected by floods in those LGAs. You can't use funds for interstate or overseas travel. We do have a, a couple of small caveats on that because some of you are actually quite close to the Victorian border and you might have things uh, where you, you need to travel across quite regularly to get to your head office or another organisation. That kind of thing can be covered. We can discuss that down the track. The mate, this is really meant to cover not doing you know, flights and lo like long trips to interstate locations and certainly not overseas travel. And you can't use funding towards vouchers, for example, you know, phone store, internet credit. We know that some of you might have been, might provide vouchers to your clients who are facing need this money can't be used for that. It can still be used for, to be clear, um, you know, uh, there's a limit on, I think, $1,000 of support per individual. So if you are supporting people through things other than vouchers, through like, you know, providing goods, and, uh, for example, blankets, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, those are completely fine. Hampers of food, that's no problem, but you can't use them for vouchers. Uh, Sarah, next one. Yeah, so as I said, we we're trying to get through this part of the process presentation fairly quickly so that there's plenty of time for questions and for the run through of Smarty Grants. So to, if you want more information on the grant program, um, firstly, the dcj.nsw.gov.au slash NGO flood recovery program, um, that is the main .html. Um, that is the main link for our web page. On that, you can find a link to the program guidelines if you've misplaced them. Um, there are recordings of previous ones of these information sessions, um, the frequently asked question document, which goes into more detail about some of the questions we often get in, rela in relation to this program. So, and also uh, uh, application links um, to actually the link to apply through Smarty Grants. So I do encourage you to have a look at that, particularly before you come through with any queries. But I should know that my team is the SBC Grants team um, uses this email address, sbcgrantsteam at fax.sw.gov.au. If you have a query, please come to us and ask. Um, this Any email sent to this will come directly to me and my whole team. I might just get um, my team to stick on their cameras and wave. You can see Sally, Denise, Sarah, and Ella. And Ella. Thank you very much. So yeah, all five of us receive any emails that come through. Um, we will try and 
um, uh, answer those your questions as quickly as possible. Like if we happen to all be in a meeting, it might take a moment, but we do want to answer your questions and we don't want you sitting around spending hours wasting your time trying to work out if something is eligible or not. Just come to us and ask the question. We know that like these application processes aren't easy. We're happy to provide as much support as we possibly can to lead you through this process. Um, we can answer any of your questions. No question is too silly. Um, and uh, like we and we really do encourage you to do that rather than wasting your own time um, playing around. Um, one of the features of this program is that uh, the local in the lo there are also local flood support officers that are being hired in each DCJ district. The great thing about that is that if you are successful for getting a grant, you will be able to tap these people for ongoing support at, through the life of the grant and they've got the local knowledge and expertise to sort of help connect you with other organisations and stuff like that. But in this process where we're doing applications, if you are located in the Murrumbidgee or Western New South Wales districts, DCJ districts, um, and there's copies of maps, etc. on our website, we actually have Annabelle and Mandy who are there to provide a bit more local support. So as you can see, so it's all very small on my screen, I can see Annabelle and um, Amandy, yep, they're waving to you now. Um, but and so they'll be, they can be in. I think Mandy was having some trouble a year before. Um, so we can put you in contact with them directly, or you can contact them directly if you're in those areas, and they can uh, also answer your questions, and they can probably provide a bit more over-the-shoulder support. And I should note that we are happy to, like, you know, if you've got access to MS Teams, which if you're talking to us here, you do. We can. We can have a chat. We can set up a time to have a chat, or the or Mandy or Annabelle can, where we'll literally like you know, help you go through the the steps of the process. Um, also, if you've already had some engagement with New South Wales Reconstruction Authority, um, and you already have existing contacts with the regional delivery teams, they all have full information about this grant program. They know they're one hundred percent across that. They can answer your questions too. And if they're not sure about the answer to any questions, they can always refer it to us. Um, any questions I said should come to us. The only questions I would say that not worth wasting your time by coming to us with are really technical questions like my password isn't working or I tried to open this screen and something crashed. We're not IT experts in my team. We're pretty OK. We can answer some queries, but really going to directly to the source with Smarty Grants is the way to go. They can provide you with those answers. They're, they're not like Telstra, um, you know, if you call them up on their number, like they do answer and they're very friendly and helpful. So I do encourage you to get in contact with that um, and they can answer those basic questions. OK, so we're going to throw it open now for any questions before we go through to the running the presentation on how to apply through Smarty Grants. I can see there's already one in the, the chat. So hello, thanks for the presentation. I viewed the guideline. Is it pops? possible to sub publish a sample legal tr contract if an organization is successful. Um, Angela, are you on the are you able to speak? I'm not quite sure what you mean by a sum sample legal contract in this context. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking my question. I yeah, so, so we just um I work at Australian Red Cross and we just wanted to see, for example, if an organisation um, is deemed successful and you're happy with how the funds will be set, spent and, and the human services and so on. Generally, what happens with most um, government departments is that uh, we sign a legal contract. So often with tenders and grants, there is a sample contract that you can view. Uh, you know, we just like an opportunity for our legal team just to quickly scan it and, and have a look. Um, so it, it's just really, you know, a due diligence process. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes 100% sense. So, yeah, so for this one, we use grant funding agreements. They're fairly simplified agreements and they're uh, identical to grant uh, to agreements that you might have received from other grants. I believe Red Cross got a grant through um, well, another one of our grants recently. And it's the same. Uh, so they've got a Northern New South Wales one. So it's the same. It's going to be basically the same template. We don't have the a sample agreement ready to go right now, but I, I'll take down your details and I can flip it through to you separately when we have it ready to go. But as I said, it's very, uh, if you've entered into anything with us that's called a grant funding agreement um, in the last couple of years, have a look at that. It'll be very close to the same. That Everything past the first page will be identical. And just at the first page, which... The main thing is with our grant funding agreements, 
your, uh, the guidelines themselves form part of your agreement, your application forms part of your agreement, and then it's quite a simple agreement that sits over the top of that. But yeah, I'll definitely send that through, Angela. And if anyone else is particularly keen on seeing a grant funding agreement beforehand, by all means, just flick us an email and we'll, I'll include you in the mail out. Uh, uh, Fran, I'll come to you next. Yes, hi there. I guess this is following on from Sandra's question. Um, we applied, uh, I, I work for Boys to the Bush, we applied for our Children and Young People Wellbeing Recovery uh, Grant and um, we've been asked to supply, you know, um, sort of auditor level detail of fine, you know, fine, you know, it's, it's exhausting basically afterwards. So, it was just about presenting, preventing those surprises by knowing what level of reporting is expected. Sure. So, um, so uh, yeah, have a first. I encourage you to have a look at the application form because that, like, we can't ask you for information much information beyond what we ask in that application form. So you'll see it there. Um, we will be sending out for everyone who's successful. They will receive copies of all their reporting templates shortly after. I will tell you in advance that reporting is extremely simple. Um, so in the case, so in this case, there's a monthly there's monthly reports that are due, and then there's a final accrual at the end. The monthly reports just involve you um, more or less counting the uh, the occasions of service that you the uh, service that you provide. So providing basic numbers on that. There's no financial data required. Um, it's just it's literally just counting what you've done in the time and a bit of space to uh, word text to say tell us what you've been up to. That's not compulsory. Attach any you know documents you might want to show us about like what you how you've been promoting your work, etc. But that again, that's not compulsory. Um, and they'll continue. The final the final acquittal at the end also is a bit more detailed, but again, it's not that it's not a detailed level of thing. One thing to bear in mind, however, is that because of the Commonwealth uh, being involved, there's a chance that you might be randomly selected if you are successful as one of the people to be audited. Um, and if that is the case, it would be a check over of your um, financial records to make sure you have covered everything off. However, we don't expect that many people will be selected to be audited. And um, again, because the, the information you provided at the, the start was high level and estimate only, you can't in a sense get in trouble from going right off the reservation. Um, as long as your money spent is fairly similar to that, you should be okay. But yeah, I do acknowledge it's hard with that level of uncertainty, but you, when you see the reporting templates, you'll be very pleasantly surprised, especially if those are the last ones you've been dealing with. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. Uh, one quick follow up. When would we expect to receive payments so that we can sort of organise um, timelines? Sure. So you should hear about the result of this in late September or possibly the first week of October. And as soon as you hear about it, the process will start. So we will then send you the grant funding agreement through DocuSign for signing. Um, and that, uh, for those of you who haven't used DocuSign before, it's just a, it's just something to save having to send around grant funding agreements by fax, etc. It's just an online program where you can electronically sign an agreement. As soon as we get your uh, funding agreement back and we sign it at our end, you'll be paid in the next following Wednesday. We do a weekly uh, funding run. So you should receive the, you should hear about it and uh, in late September, most likely, possibly the first week of October, you should receive the funding within a week or two. And that mainly depends on how long it takes at your end to sign the, the funding agreement. Uh, Karen's got a question. Uh, just clarifying, if we can claim 25% of expenses from August 22 to date. Yes, you can, as long as the, expenses are directly related to supporting uh, victims of the floods. So if you've got 25% of expense um, of any expenses, it's 25% of your, sorry, to be clear, 25% of your grant. So again, on the basis that if you have expenses of, you know, a million dollars, for those of you at the larger side of the pool, um, and you receive a grant for $100,000, you can only apply $25,000 of that grant to those expenses. So it's 25% of the grant. Um, it's not 25% of the expenses you incurred. Um, so if you, on the flip side, if you did uh, apply for a grant of $100,000, you'd only incur $25,000 of extra expenses from August, September to when you receive your grant, then you would be able to claim all of it. 
does that, sorry, that feels like I've been a bit unclear there. Did that make sense, Karen? And anyone else? <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, well, uh, if that was okay, I'll go on to Stephanie. Good question. Oh, hi, Dan. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering in all those um, list of communities that were um, at the beginning of the presentation, some of them were obviously impacted far greater than others um, and, you know, varying sizes of populations and, and that sort of stuff. Is there any sort of a waiting to, um, yeah, I guess areas that are of a higher priority or, um, you know, for us, we we cover about 300,000 kilometres um, across our sort of three main centres and we've probably done more work in some communities than others. And I'm just wondering, um, is yeah, there are, I guess, priority areas. Um, yeah, sure. So there's uh, sort of two sides to the question. So firstly, as far as formal prioritisation is concerned, um, it is we are prioritising uh, uh, Aboriginal organisations, uh, Aboriginal uh, organisations that provide assistance to culturally and linguistically diverse people, and we may prioritise to make sure that the equitable, uh, the geographic distribution is relatively equitable, so it's not just all funding for one area and not for the other. But the way we're working on the prioritisation is based, as you say, is based on need. So mm -hmm. as on top of the fact that all the, the grant program can only be used to support people who are affected by the floods as opposed to just anyone who's in those areas. When we're doing the assessment, um, we're having a, a representative from um, New South Wales Reconstruction Authority on our assessment panel, and they're providing expert advice on the current um, impact of the floods and also the flood impact of the floods back then. We've also got people from the four DC day districts, so they've got that local knowledge. And so the way we, and one of the assessment criteria is, is around need. Um, and so the idea is that when we're actually doing the assessment, it will be prioritised based on who has the most, uh, which areas are serving the people with the most need, that need that assistance and, and who has the capacity to actually provide that assistance. Yeah. Oh, no, sure, great, because I look at it and go, I'm sitting in Bathurst at the moment and that's one of the places. We yeah. weren't really impacted. I go, that would be really handy. Cool, let's just do stuff around our local area. Um, would it be needed and wanted? Yeah, but there are far more areas that, that need that support that are listed than uh, my own back door here. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. Like, if you like that, we're bound in a sense by the LGAs that were designated yeah. disaster areas by the New South, by another a very different area of the New South Wales government working with the Commonwealth. And so and they've I'm glad to see because the way they designate natural disasters means they can provide funding. So they try and do it as widely as possible so that they can do it anywhere that's even possibly been affected. And some of them were yeah. still being added in December and January because the rivers were flooding along. But as you say, we're we're very, very cognizant of the fact that the need is very different in different areas. That's very much a core of how we're yeah. assessing the applications. Great. Thank you. I've um, got a question from Fran. Um, my organization was heavily involved in sorry, I'm reading these out because the recording doesn't <laughs> doesn't uh, keep the uh, chat. So um Question is, my organisation was heavily involved in flood preparation and recovery for our communities. If we apply for a larger amount in this open grant, does that increase opportunity to be considered for a closed competitive grant in the event of future floods? Um, I think there's a few questions there. Um, there's nothing about what you apply. Just tell me, Fran, I might check in with you in a second, make sure I'm, I'm answering your question as I understand it. Um, there is no need to, in a sense, we want, like if there's a future disaster um, tomorrow in a year's time, et cetera, um, we will not be coming back to see how much money you applied for in this grant round to work out what you might be uh, might be available this time round. That's how I'm reading the question is that, is there some reason to apply for more money in this grant round in, to show your need for future grant rounds? No, only apply for the money you need. Um, and because it is based on uh, service delivery, it's, you know, you know what your increased service delivery is and your increased costs are. There won't be any th sort of, oh, they said last time they only needed $10,000 and this time they're saying they want more. Like, you know, when we're talking about this in 2025, that won't be a problem. Does that, Fran, does that sort of um, 
uh, and the and to be clear about the closed competitive grants versus open competitive grants, um, mo this isn't relevant to most of you. Um, so what we're talking about here is the open competitive grants, which is the six and a half million dollars available to all NGOs. There's also a separate closed competitive grant round. It's much smaller. It's one point one million dollars, and it was provided by invitation only. Uh, invitations were sent to a small number of providers across DCJ who. Um, were uh, may need funding and they were identified by the local districts based on local knowledge of local need um that that would be the same process if, if a we don't know how exactly what grant programs might arise in relation to a future fund there might be nothing there might be this something similar to this we're not we can't be sure we're not new south wales reconstruction authority so we don't have a core responsibility for you know managing uh grant responses but if there is another grant program like this it would be start again from scratch we would look at you know, we'll base it on our local knowledge because that's what we did the first time round. Um, but yeah, and being, uh, I hope that, does that sort of answer your questions, Fran? Uh, it does. Thank you very much. Um, it, we were, we are based in uh, Forbes, one of our hubs, and um, weeks and weeks basically of uh, work was disrupted, um, helping community repair and then recover. Um, so the 25% of this grant amount is most welcome towards reimbursal for some of that time. Um, but I was just wondering how those people in the closed um, competitive grant were considered and whether perhaps the proportion for retrospective funding was greater for those, etc. So it was a question about inclusion on those for future because unfortunately Forbes, it may happen again. Yeah, that's what we've been. Yeah, it's a tough area. And um, yeah, no, the closed competitive grants are identical to the open competitive. Like they're they're exactly the same guidelines. Everything about them is the same, except for the only difference is that there's a different amounts of funding they can ask for. Their their fundings are actually below a hundred thousand and below. Um, and they they're able to apply for both closed and open at the same time. So no, there isn't a a, a massive benefit for being in the closed competitive ground other than the fact that it's a smaller group. It's not open, so there's less organisations that might apply. Uh, Alison, got a question? Hello, I'm from Community College Northern Inland and we have all of our LGAs were affected, but it was mainly the West, like Gunnedah, Narrabri, Moree. Um, my question is around if we put in for 200,000 but you don't want to award that much, do we get pre precluded or do you come back and say, oh, we can only give you 50 or something like yeah. that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you get actually in the application form, you get asked to tick a box that says if you are not, if you're, um, if you're uh, not successful for your 200, your thing, would you accept a small, a lower amount? Okay. And so, and yeah, as part of the assessment process, like that's something we look at. And if so, there's always the chance that, like, yeah, as you say, that might be a recommendation that we come back and say, hi, yeah. we know you apply for 200 grand, but we can offer you 100 grand. Would you accept it? Okay. Thank you. No worries. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, okay, great. So what we're going to swing into now is Ella from my team is going to very kindly do a quick run through of like the actual process of applying through Smarty Grants. Um, and so I'll hand over to her. Thanks, Dan. Hi, all. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So we'll start off on the NGO Flood Recovery Program landing page. And this page, it's just got in-depth information. Oh, I apologize. My um, computer has been playing up this morning. Um, let me try and go back in. Sorry, Dan, I don't know if this is gonna be a continuing issue for my computer. Um, no worries. Let me try again. <laughs> 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 I should know for everyone, sorry, we're having some, uh, DCJ is having some IT issues at the moment, so if anything slightly goes wrong, in the, I was happy I got through the mine without our presentation knocking out. If Ella gets knocked out, we'll just vamp for a little minute or two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's see how we go. But um, <laughs> back to this page. So, yeah, this has just got, um, you know, all the information um, around the grant 
Ah, it's doing it again. Um, let me try one. If it does it one more time, Dan, I might. Um, maybe I can uh, flick the recording around um, that I do for everyone to have a look at. I'll try one more time. Um, let me just try and go down here. I have a feeling it's going to do it again because it's been quite slow. Yeah, sorry, Dan. <laughs> um, no worries. Do you um, want me? I I can when I do, I I'll have the recording done and I can flick it through to everyone. Um, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's no stress at all. So yeah, so apologies for this. Yeah, we've just been having some um uh yeah some technical stuff, and we've actually previously recorded a session of this, so we will flick that round uh, later today. And at the end of that is a uh, Ella doing a run through of the application process, and so what she would uh, and so we can definitely flick that around. That's no stress at all. Um, so apologies for that, everyone. Um, but I will note I will note that uh probably good because our time is running pretty close as well. Um, the, as I keep emphasising, the process is very straightforward. Um, I do encourage you, when we flick around the thing, have a look and see, watch the process if you haven't used money grants before. I also, I really encourage you to, you can go, follow that link for opening it just to get a look at the application form. I think that will help you get an understanding of that there's no great surprises here. Um, this isn't a, uh, you know, there are a lot of grant programs going around at the moment, especially ones you know run from New South Wales Reconstruction Authority, from the Commonwealth, plus grant programs you've gone to everywhere else. This, in my opinion, is the simplest grant program I've ever seen to apply for from a government, other than like perhaps you know the odd five hundred dollars seniors festival type grant program. Like the process for this, you're providing a lot less information than you usually would, and the process for actually doing it is quite simple. So yeah, I apologise that we don't have a little walkthrough of like um how we do, but we will send you through a, all a link on that later on. Um, did anyone actually have any questions they particularly want to ask about the application process or about Smartia grants or how it all works? Or in fact, questions about anything? So the one thing I can't emphasize enough in relation to this is that we are really all about providing support here. Um, we really want to get um, applications from all of you who might be eligible and we have resources available to provide that support. So if you have any questions, um, please just, you know, uh, come to us first. Don't spend ages wasting your own time working it out. We're happy to answer those really quick questions. If you provide, we can't answer, here is my program, will I get funding? Um, but we can certainly ask because, you know, we can't prejudge the result of the grant program. But other than that, we can answer a lot of questions. Uh, Alison? I, I I was really excited and I'm very thankful that this is opening up because I thought, oh, people are actually thinking about not-for-profits, that they're not really recovered. Um, and the thing that's happened for us is it's going to be interesting to quantify it, and I've written a lot of notes, but a lot of things just fell apart. A lot of our staff just had to go and help in community. They had to drop everything. We lost trainers, we lost staff, so we've lost capacity. And we're still trying to rebuild capacity because actually like one lady was stuck uh, in Wee War for weeks um, and couldn't come back. You know, she just said, I'm leaving the area, I can't do this. But then we had to bring people over to cover her in that admin role because the coordinator's house was flooded, like it was just chaotic, but we were still doing things. Is that what you're trying to help us with? Because we're still rebuilding. It's like I can't get traction and we're yeah. tired. Yeah, that's 100% what it's all about. Um, okay, I should like, good. yeah, so we, well, a lot of my team, including me, are from NG, have NGO backgrounds. Um, okay. And uh, we are then um, we've now had experience working on quite a number of disasters, and there's some really common points about how NGOs face it. Like NGOs are the front line, um, yeah. and you're and you're dealing with the most vulnerable people who have the most needs, who are then affected by something new. And then, as you say, then your own staff and volunteers are getting 
there's a whole lot of issues in relation to that. It's really um uh like as well as burnout, as you say, it's um about you know people have to go off and do other things, and so that puts strain on the rest of the team. And you know, there's so many different things that come up in relation to that. And this is that's what this grant program is all about, trying to okay. provide some assistance on. Oh, good, good, okay. Because I was wondering whether that was valid. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah, it would be interesting to. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for whoever thought it up. It's fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sadly, I can't take the credit, even though I wish to. Uh, but uh, it's a great, like, as I said, we ran a, a Northern New South Wales program um, uh, la that started last year, which is expiring now. And so that's been our, uh, that was, this one's very much based on that model. And it's been a really great success. And partly that has been because we've had those local district support officers on the ground who actually understand the local conditions. And so it's not like just me from my, our team from the ivory tower in Parramatta in the city, like, you know, trying to direct from above what we think is going on. There is like this local support going all the way through it. And that as part of that has meant proved why we needed this one as well. Because we wish we could have rolled this out earlier. There were just some circumstances beyond our control that meant it couldn't happen. But we're glad that better late than never where we can <laughs> to be able to provide some support. Um, did anyone else have any questions? No? Great. Well, as I said, I know and they always say, say everything three times so it gets through. I cannot emphasize enough, please come to us for support. Um, if you've got any qu questions uh, and, you know, as I said, we've made it as simple as possible, but there are always going to be questions. We don't mind coming to us. Um, as I said, if you put a send a question through to us, um, if, the, if one of the local district support officers is available and it can provide you with more advice, we might pass it on to them or we'll directly answer. Most of the time, if you've got a straightforward question, we'll just send you back a straightforward answer. I apologise we don't have a phone number attached to it. We just, uh, my team is just too small to <laughs> man a phone line um, and also do the rest of its work. But we will, like, you know, we are more than happy to call you back or, you know, arrange a MS Teams chat if you want to be able to show things on your screen or something like that. Um, we'll work out a way. Um, excellent. Um, okay. I think if there's no other questions, I'll give you all, well, we'll give you all 10 minutes back in your day to <laughs> do with it what you will. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. As I said, we will send through a um, we'll, uh, we will actually send a recording of this presentation through early next week. But because we missed out on the um, the Smarty Grants run through, we'll we'll make sure that we send you a copy of the recording of the sessions that happened two weeks ago, just so that you've got that that there if you want to quickly check through it. And so I think it's like the last ten minutes of that session you can go through and see the walkthrough. Excellent. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Much appreciated. Give us a yell if you need anything. 1st of September is the due date. We, it's really, I should note as well that like, it's very, very, very unlikely we can provide extensions. Like it will really have to be a, some sort of emergency for us to even consider it because as we said, we're really keen on trying to get the dollars out the door to you as soon as, to successful applicants as soon as possible. So that's why we're aiming for that last week of September, first week of October to be able to notify you. If we provide people with extensions beyond that, we have to slow down the whole process for everyone because we can't assess everyone. So. Unfortunately, we won't be able to provide extensions except for in really emergency circumstances. So, first of uh, Friday, uh, I should know it's, is it a Friday? It must be a Friday. First of September, yes, it is. Good Lord. 5 p.m., not midnight. Um, do encourage you to start your application earlier than that because we always have people who contact us at 4.39 and say, my computer's crashed and I don't know what to do. Save yourself that stress. Do it the night before <laughs> or earlier if possible. Um, and it also means that you can come to us with any other questions that pop up as you're doing it. Okay, thank you everyone, really appreciate it. We'll send you that stuff soon and look forward to seeing your applications. Bye for now.